Well, all right. Who's ready for some more practical advice on transformation? We've got our good friend Gotham coming up now to talk uh, about his guiding principles for successful and sustainable transformations. And he'll also give you some practical tools to help you with your initiatives. Take it away, Gotham. Thank you and welcome everyone. Today in this session, we're gonna talk about business transformations, what they are, why are they mystical, and try to look at ways of how we can deconstruct them and try to make them successful and not just successful, but also sustainable. But before that, let's do some housekeeping items. Um, this is a safe harbor statement. I just wanna state that there might be some uh, information that I'm going to talk about, which uh, may be future updates or might be forward-looking statements. And th these are things that uh, may not be incorporated into a contract. And these are more for guidance and more for us having this dialogue and conversation, but these should not be solely relied upon to make decisions regarding our offerings. The world's crazy. We've reached a pinnacle point in our human evolution where on one side, we are extremely proud of our technological and socioeconomic and medical advancements. But at the same time, we are fighting an invisible foe. And we have, it. it this pandemic has revealed that we are extremely fragile as a human race. And it also shows how much dependence we've had in the past on social interactions, on physical interactions, physical locations, and social constructs. But now we live in a contractless world and customers are adopting to these very quickly and their expectations are changing. They want, they're becoming more techno savvy and they want to have um, everything delivered to them quickly, safely, and conveniently. And many organizations with that used to, that were on a digital transformation before probably have had a leap start over it. But most of the organizations today that haven't made that leap have realized that this pandemic is that compelling event to force them to start moving forward and transform quickly. So if you look at a transformation, and this is a slide, this is one of my favorite slides that I like to use on a transformation. Every transformation and the way that the C-suite and all the leaders pitch is makes it magnificent, right? It is great, it is powerful, it is motivational, it is aspirational. It has things that we always wanted as kids. We have rainbows and kittens and uh, unicorns and they're all awesome and it's glorious and we're riding on it to the future. And using a transformation, we are going to convert our organization better, faster, harder, and stronger, and we're going to reach a nirvana state. And then we start looking at how we can implement them and start going through the motions of the actual transformation. And being logical and, be, and realizing that we want to have quick wins and low-hanging fruit, the first thing that we do is we decide that we are going to start working on our technology because that is very discreet and that's easy to work upon. We have easy, easy ways of trying to address the problems there. But if you truly look at the landscape of technology and how we want to get to in a transformation, especially in a cloud native way, it can be pretty overwhelming. And the CIOs and the CTOs and the leaders who are trying to transform, take a look at this and say, Hold up a minute, transformations are hard. It's not that easy to swap out technologies and try to figure out the right technology for our organization. And to be fair, the good friends at CNCF do have a trail map and they have an interactive landscape to help simplify the problem. But overall, it can actually be pretty overwhelming for anyone. And it makes you think about all the decisions that people have to take today if they want to do a technology transformation. And the CIO or CTO or any other CXO of today needs to have a lot of respect, uh, of respect towards the technologies, 
a lot of courage, a lot of persistence, and then they should be able to fail. They should feel comfortable enough to fail. And that's a very scary concept. And while this technology transformation is going on, we start working on processes because we want to make sure that the processes are not going to prevent us from moving forward fast. So we decide that we're going to adopt uh, Agile and we're going to make everything Agile and we're going to start rolling towards it. We're going to have various Agile boot camps and educate people. And then afterwards, we're going to read the DORA report and all these other things where we keep hearing news reports and uh, other, other statements of people deploying at least once a day or multiple times a day, maybe 10,000 times a day, right? And so they say, okay, so we've decided to be agile. We're going to be really nimble and fast. And then we're going to follow it up with DevOps. And then that's going to solve our problem. So we worked on the, uh, we've identified the technology, we start working on the process, and then we start working on upskilling people by enabling them, giving them workshops, teaching them the new way of working using Agile and Dev DevOps and uh, lean methodologies. And then the hope is that we are going to achieve success in our transformation. So we want to reach this state. This is our aspirational state. This is a target state. And the reason why we all toil towards and try to, um, try to put all our hard work and effort into to achieve. The reality, however, is slightly different. Over 70 to 84 organizations, and this was a study co conducted by many firms, um, Hardware Business Review, McKinsey, uh, a couple of others, even VMware has, has done a study here. But the reality is that about 70 to 84 percent of our transformations fail. And if you look at it, they don't. Some of them fail spectacularly, and and that's okay. And we're not going to talk about those. But then some of them have a semblance to what we want to aspire for. So if you look at this picture, it actually does meet the requirements of what we were trying to achieve. It has four legs. Um, it has a mane. It has a tail. It does have kind of a horn. And you probably will look like a badass if you do ride this and, and in, in public. But it doesn't just feel awesome like how it was meant to be. So why does this happen? And I felt that it was very pertinent to put this meme out here, especially considering that yesterday was Keanu Reeves' birthday. So happy birthday, Keanu. But the, the, coming back to the talk, why do these transformations fail so much? And that is a very complex conversation to have and definitely not something that we can cover in this small session, but we can have further discussions around it. I'm going to focus on two major drivers that actually do prevent us from transforming and achieving our success state. And the first one is a phenomenon called cargo culting. So these are actual pictures. Um, this, this is a phenomenon that was observed with tribes in Melanesia in, in the South Pacific. These islands were used as stopping points, refueling points and depots for World War II fighter planes and pilots. Um, in order to uh, continue the war against the Axis. So the Allied forces used to come and stop here, and they, they used to have a runway. They had all these various planes that were coming in. The tribes looked at this. They found these shiny birds very enamored, uh, enamoring and exciting, and they didn't know what they were for, but they found them cool. And they said, we need to have this too. And they didn't have the technology to do it. They didn't know how to go about it. But you know, imitation is the biggest form of um, you know praise, I guess. And so they built these prototypes, and some of these are actual life-size prototypes um, in using using clay and sticks and cane and anything that they could they could use at that time. There are actual runways with uh, wooden planes. There's there's someone out there sporting what is supposed to be binoculars, and then there's even a radio tower. And the funniest part about this is they went through the motion, 
they didn't actually know what it was for, but they felt that they achieved the result that they needed. Now, if we translate this phenomenon to enterprises and to our organizations, this is similar to us trying to adopt agile mindsets and lean methodologies and DevOps and not actually going understanding the spirit or the purpose behind it. And we just going go through the motions. And that is cargo culting. And it's really preventing a lot of organizations from transforming. To quote the Mandalorian, this is the way, is the one of the biggest impediments to achieving success in a transformation. The next one, in which I personally feel impacts a lot of the organizations, and there is a lot of data to back that up, is that many organizations, when they draw up the blueprints for a transformation, don't really understand the difference between change and transformation. So change is incremental. It is evolutionary. It is slowly moving from what we currently have and um, slowly incrementally improving our processes, our culture, the way we work, the technologies, and so on, and going into probably a close enough future that we feel comfortable about. It just improves the past. It is evolutionary. We don't want to go out of our comfort zone when we are trying to change. So small changes are always good, and that's why it's incremental. But what we found out is that if you do want to transform, you want to create a new and a better future, which is radically different from change. You want to rip the Band-Aid. You want to create a newer way of working, a newer better culture that you can propagate within the organization, newer technologies that will align with your mindset and help you grow and focus on customer delight. And this is revolutionary, not evolutionary. And a lot of the transformations that we are undergoing to, you know, that, that probably have failed could relate to this. We're not taking enough risks and we're not performing enough experimentation in order to achieve that transformational result. And this pandemic is causing a lot of chaos and problem to organizations that are transforming. They are starting to feel extremely uncomfortable because right now they cannot have the luxury of gradually changing and gradually improving their processes. They have to transform themselves radically, sometimes overnight, in order to achieve customer delight and in order to achieve um, all the goals that they want to meet. So what we found out, um, working with multiple organizations, partnering with them on the business transformations, and um, having led a number of transformations myself, some that have failed, and I've learned from immensely, and many that have helped uh, transform various organizations, what we've found out is that there are four major areas that you need to focus on in a transformation. So these are the four major themes um, that you need to focus on, and these four major themes transform into the areas of focus. The first one is business outcomes. Everything that you do needs to focus around business outcomes. It's cool that we talk about tangible metrics at a very low level, like the time to deploy and the time to um, the mean, mean time to uh, the MTTR and all the other metrics that we we capture from a from a DevOps perspective or from um, a monitoring perspective. But if we cannot tie it to business value, we have a problem. The next one is flow modernization. This area is focused around modernizing and reducing the friction to get to production. Then you have generative culture, and we'll talk a little bit more about it in, in detail. And then finally, you also want to evaluate your portfolio and make sure that you're aligning to your transformation, what you want to achieve out of it, and how you can use the culture and the modernized flow to achieve those business outcomes. So let's dig a little deeper into each one of these themes. From a business outcomes perspective, 
we need to work on how we can tie our transformational vision and convert them into strategic imperatives and tie them throughout your organization to the actual discrete work that is being performed. Uh, Daniel Pink, in his book, Drive, talks about how every person needs to have autonomy, mastery, and purpose. This tying and connectivity that you are providing from a transformational vision all the way down to the work that they do gives them that purpose. It gives them the why. It tells them why they need to do the things they do, what is the value they are doing, how they are promoting and helping the organization move to a much more better uh, transformational state. So this is extremely important for us to have that connectivity. Next, flow modernization. And Mick Kirsten has a great book, Project to Product, which talks about this a lot. But this is basically to reduce the amount of friction that we have and make sure that we move from concept to consumption as quickly as possible. The operating principle out here is that if it is not in production and it is not generating customer delight, then it has no value. And that is what we need to focus on when we try to modernize flow and reduce transformation uh, and reduce the friction in order to achieve transformation. The next one is generative culture. And Ron Westrom, in his um, seminal work, A Typology of Organizational Culture, has talked about three kinds of, of cultures that are predominant within an organization. And the first one is a pathological organization. In a pathological organization, there is a lot of fear. It is more power heavy. The messenger who delivers the bad news is usually shot. Um, and failure is not tolerated. The next kind of organization is a bureaucratic organization. And in this, it's all about rules and it's all about processes. And there is talk about using technology to prevent bad behavior from manifesting rather than trying to address the bad behavior directly. So we try to use technology in order to put those um, stage gates or guards in order to protect the organization. And this is usually a place where you have a lot of process overhead and there are multiple clicks or multiple approaches that are needed in order to achieve um, your, your value um, in your stream. And then the third one is a generative organization where failure is embraced and celebrated. You're constantly learning. It's more towards performance-oriented assessment of your employees. You encourage risk-taking and experimentation, and you have a growth mindset. And so the goal of generative culture is to move as quickly as possible from either a pathological or a bureaucratic state that your organization might be in into more of a generative culture. And then finally, you have portfolio management where you are going to restructure your portfolio and focus more on value that is being provided rather than um, on the, the, the squeakiest wheel or the potential um, perceived revenue that is going to be added to your, your portfolio. So those are the four themes. So let's look at how it all stitches together to create a transformation journey. And the first one is, we know where we are today currently, and we are going to perform an, uh, an assessment, which is more holistic and comprehensive, about your current state in your business transformation maturity. We then work with you and it's a workshop where we, um, we, we do brainstorming and we align with what you, where you want to be on the transformation spectrum, what you define success as, and we identify those strategic objectives that we need to align to and drive towards in the transformation. We then work with you and help with the connectivity portion of things. We identify success metrics, we identify how pro progress can be measured, and we also help you identifying and, and emoting within the organization what the organization achieves if they perform tasks. And then there's a huge roadmap that we create. It has four teams. We work on seven competencies, 21 domains, in order to help you align with your transformation strategic objectives and achieve those successfully. And then finally, 
we're going to get that successful transformation that, that you all wanted to get to in the first place. So digging in a little deeper on the holistic assessment, there are seven domains or seven branches or seven containers, depending upon how you want to look at it, that we assess you on for a holistic business transformation assessment. The first one is team and enterprise agility. This is really important because the process needs to be set in place. The mindset needs to be in place. We look at your application. We do an application uh, portfolio rationalization um, and assessment. We help work with you on flow modernization, uh, value stream mapping. Uh, we help you with um, uh, more of the automated approaches, um, the ways in which we can shift from manual intervention into more automated systemic approaches. So that's flow modernization. Path to production is another one. We help you with your de generative culture transformation. Um, there's a huge slew of enablement opportunities that you that we work with you on to help with this culture uh, transformation. We help you with the portfolio management. This is where you work on more of the lean portfolio governance and portfolio management opportunities. There are a number of um, workshops that we can do here. Uh, the focus is always going to be on business outcomes. We want to make sure that everything that we do is tied to business outcomes, and the business outcomes is the value that you get, um, and it's not the value of engagement, so so on. And then finally, we also work with you on your strategy and roadmap. So we assess you on all these. It's a 360-degree uh, holistic and comprehensive assessment that we perform. We then create a transformation roadmap and, and map out how the experience would be. So as you can see, we're going to front load a lot of things to build the momentum. We have services that we engage with. We partner with you. We teach you um, the much more um, optimal ways of working, strategic objectives, making sure we tie to your OKRs and creating growth boards or operation boards, all aligned with business outcomes so that you can have those exemplars and those indicators that you can resonate within the organization, the value that you're getting out of it. And then we help you with your technologies, cloud native, 12 factor. We help you with the metrics and observability. We definitely help you with your platform and app rationalization. And then we focus on your productivity as well, um, especially developer productivity and operator efficiency. That's pretty much what uh, we do at VMware. And this all tied together creates a systemic framework and a much more deliberate strategic approach that is very aligned to you, uh, to your strategic outcomes, and at the same time also provides that uh, data-driven decision-making that you, that you need if you want to pivot or persevere in some of the lean experiments that we're going to run. And we work with you throughout the way as trusted partners, and then eventually we will um, help you achieve your transformation. And the focus is always going to be on customer delight. So in order to get customer delight, we need to make sure that you have more apps and more features. And then we're going to help optimize your SDLC. We're going to introduce modern technologies to help you drive that customer delight. And that's going to be a continuous feedback loop. And the way we, we work um, in our framework is using, um, we, we partner with you constantly and help help you along the way. We also help you build a happier culture. And what all of this does is it creates a flywheel mechanism. And that helps drive things to go faster to the market. So value goes faster to the market. Again, remember, if it's not in production and not generating customer delight, it is not valuable. So we help you get to the market quicker. And then it gives you much more time to innovate. You are working on things, what we call as above the value line. So you're focusing on things that are much more valuable and more important to you and allowing the systems, the technologies, and the processes to handle all the other mundane and systemic things and things that probably shouldn't be manual in the first place. And when we give you more, uh, when you get more time to innovate, you're going to start thinking about things that will drive much more customer delight. And this flywheel starts picking up momentum and starts helping and driving all the conversations that you want to have. 
So, four major themes that we talked about. But the next question is, how do we actually sustain the transformation? And that, I can simplify it in the form of a haiku. And there's a lot of um, conversation around it, but the haiku will help you bring those guiding principles of the philosophy of how you want to approach sustain, sustenance of your successful transformation. The first one is heritage is past. And in this means that you constantly revere the things that are currently present or that were there in the past, and you use merciless refactoring and continuous improvement in order to continuously improve your existing portfolio or your existing footprint. The next one is improve flow for fast value. So you're constantly looking at those Kaizen events in order to reduce the friction and get to the or get to um, the production quicker so that you can have customer delight. And the third one is delight your users. If you constantly keep thinking about customer delight and how you can improve the value to them and how you can make them happier, all of these connect together and you will be able to drive your business transformation to not only be successful, but also sustainable. So with that, I want to leave you with the haiku. We've talked about four themes, and we talked about three steps, and that's the four by three approach that I promote and I've used successfully with a number of organizations. Um, love, this, love to have additional conversations. Um, I'll, be, I'll be around, um, not only here, but feel free to reach out to me. We can have much more deeper conversations and, may, and have much more specific conversations to your organizations. Thank you all for listening, and I will see you all in the Q&A. Oh, thanks, Gotham. That was super informational. And I got to be honest, I can't get enough of those gun-wielding, unicorn-riding rainbow kittens. I mean. Everybody needs those in their lives. Anyway, thanks again. Obviously, Gotham's got a lot to share. Chat with him in the Slack channel. And stay tuned for the next session. I'm really excited about this next one. I promise you it will not disappoint. <laughs>